Stockholders trying to maximize quarterly profits. Is that corrupt? No, that's how the system works, right? The system is set up to incentivize the selling of junk. Is broccoli pure profit? No, it's perishable. Produce goes bad. It's like you want profit, it's the worst thing. You want something that's shelf stable. You want the Twinkie that sits on the shelf for weeks, right? You can make money off of that. Last year was a, a massive year for, for Team Gregor. Your book, How Not to Die, was a, a New York Times top 10 bestseller. How does it feel to have helped so many people? Yeah, and in fact, right now, 20 months later, it's a top 10 New York Times bestseller. I mean, that's extraordinary. I mean, I knew it would always appeal to uh, those who appreciate my work, um, but the fact that it's had such a kind of a, a really mainstream impact, this had kind of a, become more of a kind of cultural phenomenon, that's, that's, uh, that's really exciting. And it just shows that people are hungry for this information. People want to, you know, want to make evidence-based decisions about the health of themselves and their families, which of course makes sense. Why do you think there's such an appetite for this information? Well, I think there's such a corrupting influence of commercialism within the field of nutrition, medicine broadly, but it's like, who can you trust? You get conflicting messages all the time, and they always seem to be, you know, so the dairy industry will tell you to eat dairy, and the egg industry will tell you to eat eggs, and they, you know, have their own studies that they fund to put out, and they pay off journalists, and they, you know, and so that's where nutritionfacts.org came about. But frankly, there should be 20 nutritionfacts.org. So certainly, there's about 100,000 papers published on uh, nutrition in the peer reviewed medical literature every year. Um, we, our team can read as many as we can. I mean, but I mean, there's just tremendous amount of information out there. What about fitnessfacts.org? What about sleepmedicinefacts.org? I mean, you know, someone says some new fitness routine is good for you. Is that because they're selling it or accrediting people on it? Or, or is that because it's really true? And the reason that they're selling it is because they found it so useful. Like, you never know. That's what's so frustrating. Is it true or is it spin? And so that's, that's why I do what I do. And who do you think has more influence over the, the medical industry? The pharmaceutical industries or the, the animal agricultural industries? Oh, well, uh, I mean, big pharma, obviously. I mean, the big, this is their whole shtick, right? I mean, by definition, you can't get most of big pharma's drugs, even though now they're in supplement industry and over the counter. Um, you can't get most of the drugs unless they're prescribed by a doctor. So, I mean, their whole economic model is to, you know, convince doctors to prescribe not just any drugs, but their particular drugs. Um, and there's been lots of great books and exposés written about the kind of the slimy things many of these uh, drug companies do. Um, but, I mean, so that's the direct influence. Uh, doctors aren't really getting many nutrition messages at all either way. But it's interesting, you know, when people, you know, I talk about the lack of nutrition education and medical education. Um, you know, and, and say, look, less than a quarter of medical schools have a single dedicated course in nutrition. You know, and so people are like, we got to get more nutrition in, in medicine. If it's the tr if it's evidence-based nutrition, absolutely. But if they're going to get, you know, what the dietitians are getting, right? Dietitians, that's all they do. They go through years of just nutrition education, but they come out no more. <laughs> I mean, they come out being able to, you know, mix TPN orders, which is like IV medications, but they don't know clinical nutrition, disease reversal nutrition. Why? Because their materials are written by the dairy board and by the, I mean, you know, you go to these conferences and it's sponsored by McDonald's and Coca-Cola. And I mean, that's, that's, that's what's influencing them, their education. So um, if by more medical education for physicians, it means some Coca-Cola sponsored seminar, I'd rather them not hear it in the front. I'd rather have the less nutrition education. What we need is more evidence-based nutrition education in medicine and everywhere else. What is the most striking example of biased research you've ever seen? Probably the, the industry that has really the worst track record. It would probably, well, yeah, there was that beef study, the bold study, the beef study and the, the eggs. The, 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 so the National Academy's Beef Association um, uh, funded this so-called bold study um, and uh, and then the egg board continues to find these really slimy. You know, they basically construct the 
the the study design in a way to get the result they want. And I mean, it's just obvious. I mean, what's well, obvious to anyone who knows, but it's not obvious to someone just reading the paper. It's like, oh, this isn't a problem. But then you see how they did the study and you recognize the, the biology and you realize, oh, that's outrageous, should never have been published. I mean, it was just this blatant attempt at trying to mislead the scientific community. When we learn about some of the, the misinformation and false research, do you agree that it makes us think that the whole system is corrupt? Well, see, corrupt is the wrong word. It's not, it's just the way the system works. Like, okay, stockholders trying to maximize quarterly profits. Is that corrupt? No, that's how the system works, right? I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the president of Coca-Cola doesn't have some secret villainous plans to make kids obese. I mean, they're just not thinking, how can we make kids sicker? What they're thinking is, how do I maximize profits for my shareholders? That's the system. And so, how do you make a lot of profits? Well, dirt cheap ingredients. We subsidize the sugar industry with our taxpayer dollars. Dirt cheap ingredients sell for a few bucks a bottle, right? It's like pure profit, right? Is broccoli pure profit? No, it's perishable. Produce goes bad. It's like you want profit, it's the worst thing. You want something that's shelf stable. You want the Twinkie that sits on the shelf for weeks, right? You can make money off of that, right? It has a brand name. Even a broccoli grower is not gonna put an ad on TV for broccoli because you might buy their competitor's broccoli. It doesn't make any financial sense. The system is set up to incentivize the selling of junk. And of course, we don't just subsidize sugar, we subsidize feed crops so we can have dollar menu burgers, right? I mean, so the whole system is set up, so it's not corrupt, it's not like, um, you know, they're, they're, they're s slipping, you know, suitcases full of money under something. No, it's just, that's how the system works. The system works by rewarding making people sick. How do hospitals make money? Healthy people? No, operations make, right? I mean, the whole system is set up. How do doctors make money? The most common doctor visit is called a blood pressure check. Easiest visit in the world. They come in, they get the blood pressure checked, and then you tweak their medication. Oh my God, it's like a dream visit for a doctor. You don't even have to think. You can be thinking about, you know, your grocery list that night while doing this because there's nothing to do. You just do, oh, it's too high, we'll increase the drug, too low, we'll decrease it, right? I mean, and so that's, that's, and, but that's the money that's rolling in, right? I mean, that's most of the money's coming from, all right. Now, if all of a sudden they don't have blood pressure, because they don't have high blood pressure anymore, the big pharma loses, the doctor loses, the hospitals lose, the whole system loses. No one's buying anything that's profiting shareholders. It's not corruption. It's just how the system works. But, we can take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health. We don't have to wait till you know the system catches up to the science. Um, uh, you know, we can we can change ourselves because look, it's a matter of life and death. What can the scientific community do? Oh, the scientific community. I mean, there I don't see their role as you know persuade their, their roles to do science. Their roles to do good science and to minimize conflicts of interest. To perhaps not take money from these corporate interests that are trying to skew the signs, put out misinformation. Um, and, uh, you know, look, they continue to do the science, but, you know, look, they could all retire tonight. There doesn't have to be another paper published. We already have the information. In many cases, had it for decades, right? Dr. Dean Norris published his Lifestyle Heart Trial in 1990, most prestigious medical journal in the world, proving that the number one killer of men and women could be reversed. Heart disease could be reversed with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. Like since then, no one should have died of heart disease, yet hundreds of thousands of people continue to die from this preventable, arrestable, reversible condition. While another person dies of a heart attack, why do any more research? Like the number one killer, we got the research we need, right? Look. You know me, I love research. I mean, you know, obviously, I mean, in fact, if I wasn't doing this, I'd uh, do research myself. I actually started out MD, PhD because I love the research. But, you know, toiling away in some laboratory, studying some enzyme for 40 years, while people are dropping dead by the millions from preventable diseases, I couldn't justify that. So, um, uh, so I do this to get the word out. What is the biggest misinformation about health in the mainstream? Um, 
The biggest inf misinformation about health in the mainstream is that, you know, pills and procedures are where it's at. I mean, so for most, I mean, we have, uh, for acute conditions, like break a leg, you have, suffer an infection or something, I mean, modern medicine is just amazing, right? Um, thanks to antibiotics and other incredible advances. But when it comes to chronic diseases, we fail miserably as a profession, right? When it comes to... Uh, you know, many common cancers, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, many of these things. I mean, we just, that's that, what we have to offer um, may have little or no benefit or even anti benefit, right? We kill 106,000 Americans every year through, you know, adverse drug reactions, basically, from side effects from prescription drugs. So, you know, doctors are, in effect, just from that stat alone, the sixth leading killer in the U.S., right, is, is, is the medical profession. And so, um, but look, the, you're hoping that the, the, the benefits outweigh the risks. And so you say, ah, should I go into surgery? Should I? Okay, but not recognizing that these diseases, in large part, are lifestyle diseases, are preventable in the first place. People just don't know that. Um, and that's really the biggest misconception, is that it's just inevitable. It's inevitable I'm going to get XYZ cancer or heart disease or COPD. Um, no. I mean... In the vast majority of cases, these diseases are lifestyle diseases, and with lifestyle changes, they can be prevented in the first place. So you're saying the, the, the doctors in general letting the, the pharmaceutical industries dictate their approach to curing disease? Well, most of it's ignorance, frankly. I mean, the reason people go into medicine it's not to make money. I mean, if you want to make money, you go to Wall Street or something. I mean, I mean, that's it's an easier route for to, to buy a BMW, right? People go into medicine, at least initially, because they're idealistic and young and want to help people, right? You want to take care of sick people. Like that's you know, I mean, that's a that's this wonderful empathetic empathetic drive that I think drives most medical students. Now, some of that is kind of beaten out of them throughout medical training. They come out on the other side demanding reparations and you know, give up their dreams of starting some homeless clinic and end up, you know, doing plastic surgery or something. But, I mean, I think at least early on, you know, doctors want to help people. And the only reason that they're, they don't have these, these, med these tools in their medical toolbox, they're just not aware of the power that diet can have on preventing arresting and reversing about 80% of the disease people see in primary care. 80%, these are lifestyle diseases. So, the treatment is lifestyle behavior change. I mean, the treatment is not pills and procedures. I mean, these aren't drug deficiency diseases. These are diseases of lifestyle. So we have actually tremendous power over our health and longevity. The vast majority of premature death and disability is preventable with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. So this is tremendous good news. And when doctors figure it out, they're enthusiastic about it. And how do they find out? That's interesting. So right now we're at an international... Um, uh, uh, clinical nutrition conference for physicians. And if you go out there and ask, um, you know, how did they come to this? Like, how did they, how did, you know, because they probably didn't get it in medical school, right? Because big pharma controls much of medical education and practice. I mean, you can ask your doctor, when's the last time they were taken out to dinner by big broccoli? It's probably been a while, right? I mean, this is, I mean, this is just how we get our information, both in medical school, postgraduate medical education, continuing medical education. It's all, you know, drug, most of it's drug industry sponsored. So, of course, we're going to hear about drugs. We're not going to hear about nutrition. Okay. But if you ask them, well, where did you, I mean, you obviously didn't learn about it in school. You know, why are you here? How did, why are you, why did you change your entire practice to do lifestyle medicine? And often, it's actually a patient. One of their patients, so one of the patients walks, watches, you know, Forks Over Knives or What the Health and one of these other documentaries and takes it upon themselves to clean up their diet, right? Um, uh, you know, just like, you know, getting a, you know, smoking cessation message. They say, oh, you know, I'm going to quit smoking. So they don't even tell the doctor. And all of a sudden, they see the doctor six months later for whatever. A blood pressure check or something, and all of a sudden they've lost so much weight and they feel better. Their blood pressure's down. In fact, the blood pressure may actually be too low if they continue to take pills. And all of a sudden you're treating the cause, and they don't have high blood pressure anymore. It can be dangerous. To drop their blood pressure is too low. So the doctor has to wean people off these drugs. They go back to their doctor and say, "Wow, what's happening? You don't need these drugs anymore. Your cholesterol's fine. Let's wean you off these drugs. We're not putting you on these drugs or cancel the surgery. What did you do?" And the patient's like, oh, no, I saw this documentary, I read this book, or I saw this website and heard about this, you know, and tried it and it worked for me. And that's really the convert. And so it, it's ironic. So I talk to these doctors, right? And it's like, 
Basically, that's an anecdote. It's like the lowest form of evidence that we have. Yet that's what does it, because they have a personal relationship. We're like social creatures. And you know, when someone you know, some of you family you follow for years, all of a sudden they, they've been obese all their life, they've been, you know, had all these chronic health problems, diabetic, whatever, and all of a sudden they're better. And people with chronic disease aren't supposed to get better, right? Basically, you get worse, 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 and you die. That's kind of the traditional trajectory for most people with chronic disease. All of a sudden, someone's getting better. What are they doing? And so I say, wait a second. There's been this mountain of evidence published for decades. I can show you a thousand studies that support this. But somehow, the, the stack of studies doesn't quite, you know, we aren't rational creatures, right? People just don't. Uh, you know, just, I don't know, aren't thinking that way. And it's that personal story that actually turns them. And I do this. And it, that just so frustrates me because, like, I've been telling you about the science forever. And it's this one person that all of a sudden comes along. I mean, what about a randomized control trial where we have hundreds of people? I mean, that, that should be much more convincing than one person, right? But on the page is numbers. Right, it's graphs, right? So what does it mean that X many percentage of people stopped taking, you know, had to, you know, was able to stop taking insulin for their type 2 diabetes or something like that? So each one of those is a human story. Each one of those is someone who's not going to get their leg amputated, not going to go blind, not going to go on dialysis. I mean, that's really, I mean, but I don't think people, if people don't read, they don't make that connection. But I mean, when I read papers, that's what I see. I see the, the human lives that are affected by these remarkable interventions. And I'm just trying to get this information out there as much as I can. Okay, I just uh, briefly want to talk about the, the what the health criticisms. What do you, what do you think of them? Uh, what criticisms specifically? Um, well, a, co a couple of blogs, for example, have written that the film provided a narrow view of the science with cherry-picked studies. How do you, as a, a medical doctor, refute this? Well, I mean, so this charge that, you know, someone's cherry picking studies. So, for example, you know, like with heart disease, number one killer here in the States, um, there's only one dime ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, right? And so it's not like we just picked this one study. It's, the, it's hard to cherry pick when there's only one cherry, right? It's never been shown, right? The only diet that's been shown to, you know, uh, improve mood in these randomized control trials or reverse heart disease. I mean, the, so it's not like, oh, we're not showing all the ones where the low carb diet also reverse heart disease. No, they don't exist. That's what's critical, right? Is, and so it's not, Cherry picking if there's only one chair. I mean, that's, I, mean, I think, the most critical point to make to that. And look, you have a study. You have this, this unicorn study that supposedly shows you put people on bacon and eggs and in the majority of the, their heart disease disappears. I will do a video about it that day. I mean, because people need to know that. It doesn't exist. Right? So it's not like I'm cherry picking. It's just, yeah, I'm cherry picking only the science that exists in this universe. What do you say to people like Ben Goldacre who say it's really, really hard to get good nutrition data just because of the way it's not like with drugs where you can put, where you can do blinded studies where it's one drug or the other drug and they don't know. Like ideally, you'd want to put people in just fruits and veg or meat no, no. and processed meat. There, there have that. been randomized controlled trials of diet. You put people on different diets and see what happens. That's what Ornish did in Lifestyle Heart Trial. You can randomize people to a plant-based diet and have their heart disease go away. What else do you need? Well, that study, for example, included exercise and certain people putting statins. So what I'm trying to say is with Diet right, research but there's statins not in white. both groups, right? But on one group they did the lifestyle changes, and the other group they didn't do the lifestyle changes, right? I mean, I mean, that, so like the science is in now. I mean, I mean, what else do you need, right? What was your take on like the the mainstream narrative, which says the Mediterranean diet is optimal for health? So look, if you ask, you know, so when I you know, when you go to, you know, one of these big mainstream medical conferences like Ted Med or something, you talk to people, look, they should know. They're smart people, right? Um, usually heads of departments. Um, and I say, you know, so, you know, what's your take on the Ornish, you know, work, body of work, right? Which is decades old now. And no one said questions 
the veracity, the rigor of those scientific trials, they say, oh, patients aren't going to do it. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, we can reverse RCT. Yeah, my patients won't do it. I can't even get my patients stuff. Smoking, they're never going to do it. I'm not even going to bring it up. What a patronizing attitude. That's not your decision to make. You're making the decision for your patients that they're too weak, they're too whatever, they're not going to do it. So I'm not even going to give them the option. So I'm just going to tell them, yeah, open heart surgery, whatever. And I'd say, oh, well, yeah, there's also this thing where you can eat yummy food and also reverse your disease, right? And part of it is because then the next question is, how do I do it? And they, 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 in their state of ignorance, they may not know and may not be able to counsel patients, but they know how to counsel patients on surgery and drugs. I mean, I mean, so that, the, these aren't, the studies aren't questioning, it's the compliance that they don't know what's going to do it. It's easier to take a pill. Yeah, it's easier to take a pill, but the pills don't work as well as right? So It's not just safer and cheaper plant-based diets, but can work better than the best mainstream medicine has to offer. And what can we do to get people in positions of power to take uh, meaningful action? You just have to share the information. You, you just have to get this information into people's, in, in front of people. I mean, that's the most important thing, ignorance. And we, I think many of us in the movement be like, oh, everybody know, everybody knows the processed meat causes cancer, right? Everybody knows. The World Health Organization did it. There's, you know, it was in my inbox for weeks because everyone's sending me all these. No, I bet you did a study. I bet you do a public survey. Does bacon cause cancer? Does, you know, lunch meat, deli slices, turkey slices, you know, uh, you know, sausage, does, does that cause cancer in human beings? Do we know that it causes cancer? What percentage do you think, people? I bet it's low. I bet it's low. Look, even if it was 99 percent, there's only one percent that didn't know. We got our work cut out for it. But I bet it's you know one five, something like that. The majority of people don't know that the IARC, the official body that determines what is and is not carcinogenic, right? So what else do you need? The most prestigious medical body in the world when it comes to cancer says processed meat category one carcinogen. We are as certain that processed meat causes cancer that are that plutonium causes cancer and asbestos causes cancer and cigarette smoke causes cancer. Done. No scientific debate, right? That's the consensus. So what do we do? We gotta get in people. Why isn't it on everybody's website? Why isn't it everybody, like, why aren't we telling people about it? Well, why do we keep feeding it to kids in school, like a little carton of milk, a little carton of cigarettes? What? What are we doing, right? It's ignorance. Now, in our little plant-based world, it's like, oh, everybody knows that. And so why aren't they doing it, right? No. Go out into kind of the mainstream. People don't know this. They're not on nutrition websites. They, I mean, they just don't know that they could be harming their children. But why have there not been any or many large randomized control trials, Dr. Greg? It's 2017, Dr. Greg. First of all, who's going to fund them, right? I mean, so the reason that drug companies have these huge, I mean, they can literally spend billions, billions with a B dollars to do studies because they're going to recoup that cost. The number one drug, best-selling drug in human history, Lipitor, right? This cholesterol-lowering statin drug, right? Bringing in tens of billions of dollars. So you can spend a billion dollars because you're going to recoup it, right? Um, but Who's, I mean, you got to put a billion dollars to get people to eat broccoli? Who's going to pay for that study? And so there's a problem with, with paying. Now, my answer is we should crowdfund studies. I mean, I think it'd be great if someone comes up with a good study design and uh, says, look, okay, I'm going to take, you know, metastatic breast cancer patients, right? I want to randomize them, one plant-based diet and the other, you know, some other kind of diet or whatever, right? And just like see who, who has improved survival who has lower recurrence rates. Why isn't that study being done? I mean, yes, it's expensive, but I mean, who wouldn't chip in 10 bucks? Just to see, because you wanna help people, because you maybe know somebody with breast cancer. I mean, you know, in fact, cancer charities, you know, in fact, chronic disease charities in general, where they're talking about the Lung Association, these are really wealthy organizations. Why? Because people give to them because they have a family member or something getting sick. You know, and they're like, well, I want to, you know, help out other people with this kind of condition. Well, okay, here we go, right? Why don't we crowdfund science? Um, I mean, so, I mean, I, I don't think so that should be necessarily um, a insurmountable barrier. And we have the science we need. Again, we have the science we need. Now, do we have it for metastatic breast cancer? No, that's why I'd love to do that study. But what we do have is for early stage prostate cancer. In fact, even late stage prostate cancer. I mean, so... That's, I mean, so 
look, and it works for all these other things, prevents the number one cause of death, what else do you need? I mean, there's only one diet ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients. That's a plant-based diet, right? Uh, I mean, if anyone tries to sell you on some new diet, you know, look, do me a favor, ask them a simple question. What are you saying? Is this new diet, has it been proven to reverse heart disease? You know, number one or two reason me and all my loved ones will die? If the answer is no, why would you even consider it? If that's all a plant-based diet can do, reverse the number one killer of men and women, uh, shouldn't that be the default diet to prove it otherwise? And the fact that it can also prevent, arrest, and reverse other leading killers like type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. What can't a plant-based diet help? Tons of stuff that it can't help. I mean, I mean the, the amount of research we have, how many, how many diseases are there? Thousands, right? How many, how many diseases have been proven to be reversed with a plant-based diet? A handful, right? I mean, we just don't have science. But it's like even if a plant-based diet, there's no data to suggest it works for disease X, well, you still eat a plant-based diet because like, bad enough you got X. You don't want to have X and 10 other things, right? And look, it's the leading cause of death, right? It's number one reason. I mean, so of course you'd be on a healthy diet regardless, right? It's like, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, does stopping smoking help me with fibromyalgia? I don't, well, there probably is data on that, but let's say there's no data. There's never been a study that looked at smoking cessation for fibromyalgia, right? So would you say, yeah, don't worry about stopping smoking? You say, look, it may help, it may not help, but you stop smoking because it's not good for you, right? I mean, there's other things, that, right? How about fibromyalgia and lung cancer? How would you like that? right? That'd be worse, right? So you don't smoke, whether or not it directly helps disease or not. And is there any evidence to show that a plant-based diet can treat or help or even prevent infectious disease? Oh, well, I mean, infectious diseases have different causes. Um, and so certainly there's um, studies, for example, showing that if you take older men and women, 50s, 60s, 70s, you randomize them into two groups. One, you give them more fresh produce, more fruits and vegetables. You can significantly boost their protective antibody response to pneumonia vaccination compared to those that don't. So you can get, you can improve their immune function. Now, does that translate out into lower pneumonia rates and disease endpoints? We don't have that data. That'd be more good studies to do. And what do you want your, your legacy to be? Um, my legacy um, is, uh, is just putting is getting this uh, out to people. I, seriously, as soon as people are exposed to this information and understand it's, it's from a credible source, then it's totally up to them. And I'm going to leave it to other people. Other people can be like, let me show you how to make good recipes. Let me show you how easy it is to go out to eat. Let me show you, this is what to make your potluck, right? Okay, all the kind of how, look, I, as long as people have this understand, understanding, um, that's as far as I, I mean, if, as soon as everybody in the world knows the truth, what is the truth? I'm retiring. Any I am going to be on some desert aisle drinking kale smoothies on the beach. What is the truth though for people tuning in and they can only listen for 30 seconds? 30 seconds. The number one cause of death the number one cause of disability, according to the Global Burden of Disease Study, the biggest study of disease fact risk factors in human history, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Number one cause of death, number one cause of disability is our diet. Here in the States, cigarette smoking not only kills about a half million Americans every year, whereas our diet kills hundreds of thousands more.